listening to this one. And so in, in doing the research for it, which is going to make me, I, I feel like a bit of a fraud. Uh, I feel like a bit of a fraud in that, you know, probably 90% of what I'm going to speak on is based on research and based on what I saw when I was looking through this. Before I left the classroom, now five years ago, when we still had the kids every single day, I tried to do a little bit of this with one of my Math 30-2 uh, classes. We did a little bit of working through some of some of these ideas. Uh, but again, it was, I was still seeing the kids. So it wasn't this, it wasn't the model that we are, you know, kind of projecting that we're going to see in the fall. It was a completely different sort of scenario. So, so like I said, I do feel like a tad bit of a fraud with regards to this, but based on that, I'm going to give you my best input into how I see a flip learning model working. Uh, what I did discover is that the model I think that most of us foresee may not be the model that is going to work best for kids. So, so I'm going to jump right into the presentation and uh, I'll share my screen and hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys are okay with looking at this. I'll try and jump back and forth as I usually do here, but, uh, So in, inside of here, uh, like I said, going through a couple of the different models that I found that I think are gonna be effective because I think they're gonna help us to, to look at flipped learning and flipped classrooms a little bit differently. I'm going to throw out a little bit of the research that I found. I found a whole lot more research at the post-secondary level than at the K to 12 level. And I think that that's because that's what they do, right? They do research, so when they implement this, they go deeper on it. Uh, a lot of what I found at the K to 12 le um, level is just opinion based and uh, experience based and there's no real research backing up some of it. There was a bit, um, but we'll go through that. I found what I think and number three there, the, the sort of model and I believe it was by Jeff Dunn that kind of is the one that people have been following. I think that that's a little bit outdated uh, for the scenario that we are going to see potentially in the fall and stuff like that. So I sort of tried to adjust that in step four to some that I think are a bit more applicable. And then I also want to throw in, you know, a little bit on SAMR. For those of you guys who haven't heard of SAMR, I think that, uh, yeah, Robert Talbert is in there. He is a post-secondary. So he's out of Minnesota. And that is, uh, I think that's slide number four. Um, but definitely, yeah, Gord. Um the SAMR model, I think, is something that we can actually build on when we start doing the modeling. Uh, and and everything that that is going to be talked about today is 100% a mindset type idea. There is no magic bullet. I wish I could say that, oh, these guys have everything all laid out and it's good to go. Um, but there is nothing. And then uh, step six is, is maybe what people were looking for, which is the where to get content from and stuff. I threw in a slide. Uh, farther down to a couple training opportunities that are coming up that I think might be fairly valuable for a blended learning model and whatnot. Um, but we'll go off of there. So, uh, so these guys here, the blending learning universe, the first, uh, the first of the models to follow. I really liked what these guys had to do with the models because they took down a blended learning platform essentially on in face to face and online which again, we're gonna see something completely different. And the one that I really liked here, they did have the flipped classroom model. This is an absolutely wonderful uh, video from PBS on flipped classrooms. I think it's well worth a watch. Please don't watch it well right now, but it's well worth a, a watch there. Um, but down a little bit farther, there is a enriched virtual model. And I think that this is the model that we are going to see in the fall, most likely, uh, that we're going to be under. So the idea that uh, kids don't necessarily need to come into class all the time, and we may only see them face to face once or twice a week, but we're going to be doing a lot of stuff online um, at a different thing. So of all of these, and unfortunately, there is no model with regards to this, of all of these, I think that enriched virtual model is the one to follow um, with regards to these guys. Sorry. I apologize for that. Um, if we jump back to, if we jump back to this one here, the flipped learning network, 
these guys were a little bit more old school, but I did like some of the stuff that they had. What I actually liked about the flip learning networks model um, was it broke it down into essentially four sections. Again, their idea is based on face-to-face -face day after day. So it is something where we're seeing the kids all the time. How do we how do we implement that in ours where we're seeing some kids one day and some kids another? So, but what I liked about them is with each of their different pillars, FLI and P, they had little sort of outcomes or indicators on levels of success for each of these different ones. So for the flexible learning environment, you know, I established phrases that are spaces and timeframes that permit students to interact and reflect on the learning as needed. And and little tips on, you know, checkpoints for us to watch over as teachers as we're planning it. I I believe the first couple learning culture is going to be massive. I think that that's going to be huge in convincing our kids. It's going to be different than where we're at now. But I think the intentional content and the professional educators are going to be two that we definitely need to, uh, you're going to want to spend some time looking on. There's a PDF on this as well that allowed you to zoom it out a little bit bigger. So I thought that those were quite good. The other ones, the other activities, and again, just kind of throwing stuff down in here that I wanted to throw in were these two. Uh, Education to Save the World. This is Julie Stern, very outcomes-based sort of grading uh, and, and uh, sorry, I made a mistake there. Very um, not outcomes based. What am, what's the word I'm looking? Content focused, big picture, you know, sort of essential understandings based ideas when she gets into this. She has some learning models and some templates and plans that are, I thought, quite good. Some of them down here are from Alberta. She was just through a little while ago on concept-based, concept-based, that's what I was looking for, uh, a concept-based kind of tour, um, promoting her books and stuff like that. Obviously, she was. it was great. All of this stuff is free from what I can see, and there are some really good ideas on how to plan in here. My thought is, is when we start planning for this, we need to plan for those essential understandings. We need to plan for those big ticket items and not get caught up with the nuances in some way, shape or form. Not that we can you know, ignore that, but with those big ticket items, it's gonna allow us to focus our time more productively on what we need. So, um, so that's Julie Stern. And then these guys here, this is uh, Ron Richard. Uh, for those of you who have looked at Cultures of Thinking in his Project Zero out of the uh, Harvard Graduate School for Education. He's got a bunch of thinking routines and the idea with, with their cultures of thinking is to make thinking visible. A lot of what goes on here may need to be adapted because some of it is speaking and responding and moving back and forth in more of a discussion and conversation type scenario. But there are a lot of good ideas in here on how to get the kids to start thinking and making their thinking visible to us. So questions to ask, you know, little routines to follow. And it is a, a matter of getting in the habit of following these routines and not trying to go, okay, today we're using, you know, think, pair, share, and tomorrow we're using Jigsaw and then we're getting to another one and another one and another one. It's about really in reading his book, it's about building on a few of them and then digging deep into those ones. So figuring out the ones that work best and digging deep. What I like about his stuff here is he's got some ideas based on teaching areas. Uh, and so getting down into, I know that we have some of the math people in here, so I won't even pretend, but getting down into some of the math stuff, you know, here's some ideas on, these are the core ones, how to get deeper into some of the ideas when you're introducing new ideas, some of the ones to talk to. I really actually like this three to one bridge. I've used that in a couple of training sessions. Um, yeah. And so we won't go through all of these, but I think that those are some great places to start with the activities because we're going to need to, truth be told, in the fall, I think the expectation for education is going to be a little bit different than what we had in the spring here, where it was like a surprise type thing. I think in the fall, the expectation is probably going to be a little bit higher on academics and results, no matter what we're looking at. Um, because of that and because of the unknown of the situation we're in, that's obviously why we're here talking about flip learning, but we are going to have to develop these new activities and stuff like that. So I think there's some really great stuff in there. There is some research in here 
uh, I think it's worthwhile taking a look at. Around the 2013, 2012 is sort of when these guys, uh, Bergman and uh, Sam's, this is an ISTE book, Bergman and Sam's called Flip Learning. And there's another one called Flip Your Classroom. They have a whole bunch of these uh, based on the different subject errors. It was, uh, yeah, I, I believe that in the Flipped Learning Toolkit from Edutopia, they're the two guys that are doing this one, um, Bergman and Sam's. So this is back in like the 2012 is I think when they started doing the research on that. And so in between there and about 2000. 12, 2015 is where we're seeing a lot of the writing on it, a lot of the excitement around that. And then it kind of fell off and sort of, that's where a lot of the stuff went through with uh, post-secondary. So here's your Robert Talbert, uh, Gord. Um, these were the key things that I pulled out of what does the research say? He's got two actually other articles. He posted uh, a series of articles. These are from his web or from his blog. So they are blog based. But it is somewhat based in research and he breaks down some of the studies that have been done there. His two most recent ones are sort of a negative view on flip learning. And that negative view comes more out of the idea of uh, it, it's, it's broadening the gap, the haves and haves nots. This idea of flip learning is sort of broadening that. And the ones that have access to technology and the ability to do this stuff are succeeding well. The ones that don't necessarily are, are sort of struggling with this. Now, I see this in some of our schools, but I also see that we have the resources to get out to our students to hopefully help them over some of these gaps. So um, don't let his last two articles, I would say, throw you off. But from this one, what does the research say? This was, uh, I, I believe, a 2017 article. Uh, I think that these are key. If the pre-class activities are simply telling students to watch videos and maybe do some exercises without structure or any kind of feedback loop, those tend not to get done. So he was talking again about the idea of, you know, again, flip classroom, give our kids the videos and then they come in and we do all these cool things in class. He found at a post-secondary level, if it was just busy work and his words, not mine, but if the, the activities were just busy work, they didn't necessarily get done. And so something to keep aware of as you're creating these, this content for the kids, right? I just wanna see, I saw something pop up. Um, also how to make teachers accessible during the upper levels of Bloom's Taxonomy. There's a lot of connections between this and Bloom's Taxonomy as well. So we could definitely get into some conversations surrounding that, yep. Um, and the other one, and I think that this is sort of both ends, right? Is um, what are we asking ourselves to do? And I think that that's the first one. We're asking ourselves to make sure that the activities, the pre-activities that we give to our students are engaging to our kids and not just busy work. The next one is, how? Are, what are we asking the kids to do? And he was very clear on that. In fact, he says, his statement after this one is, there are no, no shortcuts to this. So you have to be clear about the expectations for student work and why the class is set up the way it is. That one's kind of because we're being forced to, but you know, again, persistence in making sure students know what they are supposed to do and why they are doing it, constantly solicitating student feedback and acting on it. I think that that's super telling to me. Um, I know with my own students, I'll use a, a simple example. They have Mathletic accounts and everything. I don't know that I've had something from the teachers, my guys are younger, something from the teachers saying, here's what I expect them to be doing with Mathletics. It is more of a, they should be doing half an hour to whatever it is, a day or a week or something like that. And I think we have to be more intentional with, here's what I'm expecting the kids to do, and here's the outcome with regards to this stuff. So, uh, to make sure that, that we're meeting those needs. So. Um, the other one was, again, this one came out of Minnesota. This was actually from a different survey. Uh, so this is from a different one. I can't remember the name of who did this survey, but the essence of the flipped classroom is moving the direct instruction and the lecture outside of the classroom and then provide active learning opportunities for students in the classroom. I think that that's important because our students, when they're in our classroom, need to be active. We're removing a very positive, and, and everything I read is, you know, lectures, <laughs> we may say what you want. Some people are gonna call them bad. Some people are gonna call them good. Uh, they're effective teaching methods. Uh, and, and they're the best way to get a mass quantity of data out to these kids 
very quickly and and in a manner that we know the message has been presented in one way now they can be done very poorly don't get me wrong when i say that but they can also be very effective in what they do the idea is to take that effective method and remove it from the classroom and then make the classroom time for active learning op opportunities so major consideration for fiddling in the classroom is to take the focus away from the teacher and put the focus on student learning Recorded lectures tend to aid struggling students because they can rewatch portions of lessons they do not understand. And I, I think I threw that one in and I think that that one is one that speaks to all of us. But I think that 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 one is something that we kind of knew going in, but we always need to be reminded. Sometimes we're not necessarily doing this for our high end students. Uh, sometimes we're doing this for the struggling students and those are the ones that we sometimes need to take a look at so so here's the jeff dunn model this is a 2014 model i kept coming back to this one again and again and again as i was doing my exploring um is uh six methods plan record share change group and regroup this model is the idea where you're still seeing your kids every day you are just asking them instead of doing homework at home to do some of these activities online so you are planning your activities you're recording your lessons you're sharing with your stu your students you're telling them what you expect um, and then when they come in you're grouping them and getting them into small tasks i think the problem and part of the reason this is a, i think a great system i think this could be very effective but i think the issue we're going to run into with in the fall is that half of our kids may be here on monday and the other half here on tuesday and if we're giving a, a session and they can only alternate days, we're going to struggle with the ability for them to group and do work um, when they're here. And, and maybe we won't because maybe on days when they're not here, they're doing alone stuff. And maybe on days when they're there, they're doing uh, collaborative stuff. But I don't know that that is necessarily the most effective method for what we're going to see in the fall. So, so I try to adjust his six. And I know that I'm, I mean, these are more my thoughts and I don't have a basis for this. So my basis is based on what I was reading and research. And I hope you guys will stay with me on this. But number one, I think providing students content to binge if they want is, is going to be important. Getting a lot of that preloaded material up front. So some of those kids that, you know, may spend one night doing all of it and then come in with a bunch of questions is going to be important. Um, I if at the very least it's not going to hurt i think that we can then send home a routine where this is where we expect the students to be by at such and such a time and then when they come in we'll be able to identify that hey you should be here by now this is where i'm speaking to students who have gone beyond that we'll be able to address those needs as well so identify the essential outcomes i think that that's going to be so critical for us in the fall is to be able to take that curriculum and know what can we drop there are always outcomes in there that we, if if we have taught higher level subjects or higher level, higher grade subjects, we know that they're in some cases dead end. They don't necessarily lead anywhere and not that we can eliminate them, but let's get those critical ones in there. I, I sort of tried to think of it in, if I was planning, as opposed to having the time when I could just review with the students, what do they already know? to help them to identify their misunderstandings and then look at what they need to know based on that and so respond to what they're doing and then also what do they need to know or what do they need to do to get that understanding i part of my thought was and this is where i think i, I feel bad for for new teachers coming into this model because they may not be aware of what the misunderstandings are or where some of these outcomes are leading. And I think that that's, that's where they're going to lean on uh, on some of the more experienced teachers. But I think that we teachers who have experienced some of the, the curriculums are able to take a better look at it and go, I know that the students always struggle with this because coming out of grade seven, they think that dividing by zero equals zero. And so that's one thing that I know I need to break and I know I need to put some emphasis on or something like that, right? Or I know that moving into the, the higher level, we can make everything into an equation solving question. And for those of you who aren't math people, I apologize, this is where I'm coming from. So uh, stay with me though. Um, we can make things into an equation solving question and then we know that's gonna be successful. So I'm gonna spend a little bit extra time on equation solving um, is one of the things I would say. Use the SAMR model. I'm going to jump into this. Well, you know what? I'm going to jump into the SAMR model right now. For those of you guys who are not aware of the SAMR model, 
SAMR model is a, um, a model put out by, uh, I always butcher his name, Ruben, very long name. And uh, he uses this model for technology integration. So the idea being is there's four different levels, uh, substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. Substitution is essentially replacing a activity we do right now with a tech activity, uh, typing, writing an essay, and then typing it up. Same activity, nothing new, right? Augmentation, we add in spell checking. We are just changing that activity a little bit, right? Modification, we're allowing that activity to change. So maybe peer editing becomes easier or something like that. And then redefinition, we are taking that entire activity that we would normally do with students and we would throw it out and we would pull it back in as a totally redefined activity because of the collaborative nature and stuff like that. So, so I, I think that it's important to keep this model in mind as we're looking at the flipped classroom because I think in some cases using a video is not necessarily going to be our, our best activity or using some type of technology may not be the most effective means to address something. It might be a lot of flash for the exact same payback. So that return on investment may put us somewhere, we may spend a lot of time trying to get up here when we should have just done a simple substitution method or something like that. So, so I, I think that this is a model to really keep in mind uh, as we're going through this. So, and I'd love to spend some more time talking about some of these things. So um, are you using videos? Again, question, it doesn't necessarily all need to be videos and where are they coming from? I'll show you some places to get some, some content. How are they being presented? So this is from that flip learning network. And this was one of the things I liked. He came up with, and he called this a learning map. And it's almost a mind map type situation. He's using Google Slides for this. And each of his different um, blocks is a clickable link to either a video or some more explanation or something like that. So essentially, he's created, you know, I hate to say this, but he's created a smart notebook in a Google slide, right? We used to say, put your smart notebooks, put an entire unit into one smart notebook, and then you have all your links, everything you wanna click, everything you wanna do. He's doing that with Google slides, with the ability to click to different pieces and that learning pathway. So the kids are traveling along that pathway, that connected chain to know what is the next activity they can do and where do things come back together. I think these pathways could potentially get very complicated, but I think that they could also be very useful as we start to look at that. So um, this might be as opposed to just a playlist or a YouTube playlist or something like that. Uh, this might be an interesting way to present the material to have the students walk along. Again, remembering back to what we said about communication, it'll be important that the students understand how to traverse these learning maps and learning pathways and not just, uh, and not just give it to them and set it and forget it type idea. So, uh, what are you going to do with your class time? Looked at a bunch of different activities on what to do with class times. I sort of squashed these down into a couple. Uh, and they were separated by different subject levels and everything like that. But, you know, manipulative centers, hands-on labs, there's kind of our math science type thing is how do we get the kids learning physically in front of us? And I think that our elementary teachers are really good with what they do with centers. And I think that our high school teachers, um, I think we could learn a little something about from our elementaries with centers on some of this stuff, right? Uh, Humanities, we got the discussions, conversations, writing and reading each other's works and doing critiques in that way. I think that those are some things that we can do synchronously and asynchronously. So in that blending learning environment, the idea of critiquing somebody's work is something that maybe we can do offline and not necessarily online. So to give some ideas in there. Uh, I threw one in for, you know, phys ed people as well. This is a, you know, such a simple idea, playing a game instead of explaining the rules. <laughs> create a video of the rules, explain those all. And then when the kids show up, it's it's time to play the game and we get down to actually doing it, right? So the other thing I sort of thought about was uh, cross-curricular projects. How do we make use of those cross-curricular projects and bring those together? Uh, and, and, you know, I had an idea in here and I, I hope I didn't take it out. I think it's, it's later on. Yeah, it's later on. Um, the idea of a flipping buddy, have a buddy that you're flipping your classes with and how can we make use of a flipping buddy to do some cross-curricular pro um, 
projects and stuff like that. Where again, coming back to those essential outcomes, what spend and what can we do? So, all right, I'm gonna skip number eight. We already talked about the SAMR. Jump down to here one. Um, here's some here's some tips that I have. I, and again, I will share this again. I see that there are some uh, some posts in the chat. I'm gonna try and get through this content. I'll share this one more time in case anybody didn't get it. Uh, all of these links are active. Uh, all of them I found uh, were either free or I had some free stuff associated with them. Uh, a few that I wasn't aware of beforehand, uh, Biointeractive I had never seen. I know CBC Curio is one for social studies that uh, we have one school that subscribes to. I think it's about $300 a year or something like that. It may be something to consider. And you know what, if our, we have humanities people out there and elementary people that are using it, we should potentially make sure you let us know so that we can look at, does it make sense to do a division wide type thing or at least pool it all together and schools still pay a little, but we do that. I know that I have a survey out right now on streaming services, but I did include Learn360 in here. I know that a lot of people are using the YouTube. YouTube's free, YouTube's wonderful and everything like that. Learn360 is filtered assuming that we go forward with that subscription, which uh, I suspect we might be doing in the fall. I, I have no insight on that, but I suspect we might just based on the learning environment. Um, that one's one to maybe take a look at. National Film Board of Canada, some wonderful stuff. They still have the uh, the cat came back on there for anybody who knows that one. So anyway, um, producing your own content. And this is where I sort of, you know, so there's a the free stuff. If you haven't seen Ed Puzzle, Edpuzzle is a very interesting tool that allows you to import uh, videos from Vimeo, YouTube, stuff like that, and insert different pauses into them. You can have a certain number of videos on your account for free that students can then connect to, and it will pause, ask a question, ask for a response from them at different points. So I think to when I did a little bit of flipping, I would have sort of a guided sheet. I would go through the video and I would say, you know, at this point, two minutes, 57 seconds, pause and take a look at this. Tell me, you know, answer this question or something like that to make sure that the students were, uh, you know, going through and looking at it. It gave me some way to sort of figure out what was going on. I didn't have uh, the ability to see if they were doing it. This one is a, a tool, online tool that allows you to do that. So, um, but for your own content, keep it short. Uh, I throw in there, when is the last time you sat through a 20 minute YouTube video uh, or clip? I, I did, but that's because I was watching something on like van lives or something. I, I have this fascination lately with buying a van and going off the grid and everything like that. And, but it's like, it's not something I was forced into. It's not one of these things where someone said, you have to watch this and you're going to be tested on it. There was an interest level in me and that's why I sat through it. I, I sat, I skipped through a lot of other videos, right? And I think that that's what we'll find our kids doing is skipping through different sections, different portions and stuff like that. Let your personality come through. This one I think is important. The difference between you and the Khan Academy is the students know you. You are their connection. You're the one that's in a lot of times that they're working in these classes for. So I think that that is important uh, when you do that. I had the idea of a flipping buddy in here. I thought that it could potentially be somebody in your school that is your flipping buddy as you're working on stuff together. But I also thought it would be a cool idea to connect people from different schools. Uh, again, we'll go with math stuff. Um, Gord and I connect on some math thing. It's not a Gord talking for 10 minutes. It's the two of us maybe having a conversation or maybe we can trade off on some of these content videos where he does the planning for one, I do the planning for another and we're conversing and giving our own little tips and tricks as we're going through and giving our lecture with these kids. Um, you know, all the work, half the time invested, somebody to talk to, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of something there. I think it might be interesting. So I think I think there's some potential with that one. Um, don't waste the student's time. Reflecting back on number one, keeping it short. If uh, if the students aren't invested into it, I think they're just going to fast forward, pause or not watch it. Right. It's that busy work thing up there before annotations and call outs. I found a lot of people were saying this and I know it's three thirty. I'm going to try and finish this up here. I know a lot of people were saying the annotations and call outs, the little pop ups can be done in we video very simply were easy things to do. The post-production, the editing portion, 
Uh, some people said they do none. Some people said they do a lot. I think it really depends on what you want to do. One of the nice pieces with that is they were saying you can sort of have a checklist of things that you're going through with you, with your callouts and your pop-ups and stuff like that. So it makes it a little bit more interesting for kids maybe to scroll backwards, rewind, or maybe scroll forwards to a different section so they know what's going on. Uh, it could also be a physical. I was thinking a lot of us have document cameras now. So to have that, you know, you're doing a question, Zach, we were just talking about you're doing it on your iPad, but maybe you're just doing it on a piece of paper under a document camera and uh, you bring in that little pop-up, your, your little physical sliding checklist and your check, check, check. All right, now I'm here. Slide it off and keep going on the problem is, is sort of that visual reminder of what you're doing. So, um, And this one, I feel obligated to say, keep it copyright friendly. If we're making these public, if we're going to post them on YouTube and stuff like that, and you don't want them to pull, be pulled down, just be aware of copyright uh, with regards to audio and stuff like that. That's primarily where their scanning has come from uh, with regards to YouTube. But also as we're using other people's works, just throw and give them the credit that they deserve and stuff like that. And I think that, that uh, that's an easy way. Myopenmath.com, that was one. You know what? I forgot that one. I'll throw that one into, I'll edit this uh, presentation after. Thanks, Court. So last one I'm going to throw up here. This first one, creating engaging science instructional videos, just came through this morning in my in my link. This is one put on by WeVideo. It is a free presentation. If you click the link up here, it'll take you to that. I suggest you register because they said you don't even have to go. They're going to send you the link to it afterwards. So even if you just register and go, I think it's worthwhile. This guy here is the ISTE Summer Institute. Uh, and sorry for those of you who are squinting there, we'll try and zoom it in. Oops, and I did the exact opposite. The ISTE Summer Institute is normally 250 bucks. It is uh, $20 now. It's available all summer. There are 13 different courses, I think, going on throughout the summer. Um, and they are just a couple hours a day in some cases. But you, if you do register for $20, probably US, uh, they'll be live for those three weeks. You have access to them until the end of October. So even if you don't get through all of their courses on blended learning, the focus is on blended learning in this one. Even if you don't get through all those courses or stuff, you'll be able to go back and take a look at them as well after the fact, a look at the materials and things like that. And to me, I think that that is, uh, that's going to be super valuable. That's one I know I'm definitely looking at. So I feel horrible. I talked for 33 minutes straight there, but really quickly here, we'll jump back into this. Do you think Google will have breakout rooms like Zoom does? I don't know, Stacy. Uh, that way we can get groups and discuss them going back and forth. I did do a little webinar on how you could do breakout rooms with Zoom. Uh, it does a little bit of prep work on your part. And there's a few issues, but it is in the in the YouTube uh, playlist. There's one of those. If you want, let me know, and I'll send you the link directly to it. Uh, it is not directly inside of there, inside of Meet, but it's uh, it's a way that you could do that. So, do we know if dips and pats are still planned? I just heard this morning that Jason Kenny announced that dips are uh, yeah diploma exams are happening in August for the fall like the uh, the summer session sort of writing. I heard that he announced that. I haven't seen anything about it. It came from one of our directors um, and said that they just heard that announcement. So I, I'm gonna suspect yes. I'm gonna suspect that we are going to see uh, provincial exams coming up in the fall. So I thought we were told not to use Zoom to do to security issues. Yes, we are highly recommending not to use that. Uh, we haven't gone so far as to block them, Zoom, um, but I know that some teachers are working with their principals and their principals are accepting that this is the best tool for them to use and so allowing them. I know other school divisions uh, are have blocked it at their uh, firewall level. I, th With regards to security, I, there are some issues there. There's issues with all of them. I think what we're seeing a lot of is these big public ones where you have a church that posts the link and then you're getting people jumping in on that link. And so how do we police that? How do we follow that through? So um, I think that there's a lot of competent people up here that can set up Zoom in a very secure method and not really concern uh, with regards to the security around it. So that being said, as my official word, we promote, uh, <laughs> we promote um, meets, 
And, uh, and if, if meat isn't meeting your needs, uh, talk to me and we can also take a look at Blackboard Collaborate, um, which is what our PBB uses. We have the ability to, to make use of some of those if we want as well. So um, yeah, and that's uh, Collaborate has that. It's, a, it's different. I mean, there's, there's pluses and minus. We can get into those later. So that's, I'm six minutes over here. So I'm going to stop the recording. I will stick around. I'm going to update this, uh, this presentation with uh, links. If you guys have ones that you use that you would like to share, please send them my way and I will, I will share them uh, into, the, into the presentation. Uh, but I thank you guys for your time. Tomorrow, I'm going to look at uh, synchronous and asynchronous tools. So kind of tools to help promote that. So, you know, kind of building on that flip theme, but some of the ideas there. And then uh, Thursday, I'm going to look at, uh, I, I listened to a really great podcast the other day, and the gentleman was talking about tools that he used essentially to, to help students in filling out worksheets, kind of taking that worksheet and making it online without totally tweaking it 100%, but making it a little bit more effective. So I'm going to try and go through some of those and see if uh, see if some of the tips that he had were helpful as well. So that's the next couple of days if you want in. Uh, great. If not, they'll be posted on YouTube. I'll share these as well. So I'll stop recording now and uh,